This is the 50th New Zealand Christadelphian Bible School. Our third period study is Brother John Popel on Growing Closer to God. The subtitle for today is Learning to Pray. This is the fourth talk in the series and the introductory reading is Luke 15 verse 11 to the end. Brother John. Good evening once more, my dear brothers and sisters. I do uh, offer an apology, considering it's come this late in the week, but I should explain, uh, all these slides can be made available to you. Um, Not only Brother Ton is uh, cleverly uh, encrypting them along the DVDs, but if you have your own flash drive, I can happily give you any of the PowerPoint series you need. So don't feel that you have to take notes to get the information, but if you like to take notes, obviously, uh, please continue to do so. This is the last talk there of the series of four, Growing Closer to God, and now we're going to look uh, at the best example of all. We're going to look at the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't therefore look at his life as we do at the others to see how he closed the gap with a pr- by overcoming a shortcoming that he had, because it's not, um, it's not possible for us to detect shortcomings in the development of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if there's something, I think, where Jesus really stands ahead and shows us a way in which we can all improve, it's about learning to pray. I'm not suggesting you don't know how to pray, but how to develop one's prayer life. Prayer, I speak personally, but perhaps I speak for more than just one. Prayer is a very difficult activity. It's very difficult to know the point, the reason, the correct manner of construction. You already know that the Lord God knows everything you think and feel even before you express it. So you wonder even about its value. So it is a very difficult thing, but I have every confidence that if a disciple were really to say to me, I want to be a better disciple, what should I work on? Almost certainly the, the answer would be, improve your prayer life. I just feel that that's likely to be the case. A very difficult answer, um, uh, but perhaps the necessary one. Why pray? Straight question. Why pray? I think many good answers could be given. What might you suggest? To talk to God. God. And that's good. And yet, you know, if I were to be, be adversarial, I would say, but God already knows what I think. But you're still correct. I, I don't, don't dispute that. And perhaps... I think that's a really good answer. If you didn't hear Brother Paul, the idea is that in articulating and vocalizing your own thoughts, you begin to crystallize them. In other words, yes, God knew what you were thinking before you prayed, but you might not have done. And as you actually begin to find words or at least feelings in which to express that prayer, we learn to refine our feelings and understand more about what it is that we really want. We're acknowledging God. We're acknowledging his presence, yes. We're acknowledging that we know that he's there. And here's a very simple answer that uh, attracts me. Why pray? Because Jesus did. We're told he is our example. And if his resonance with the Almighty Father was even greater than ours, i.e. his distance between him and his Father was less than ours, then God knew what Jesus was thinking even more, if that's not a foolish statement, then God knows what we're thinking. And yet Jesus prayed. And if Jesus did it, we can trust it's the right thing. Remember, one of the charges we have in discipleship is become like Jesus. Well, to become like Jesus, we do what Jesus did. Not just in appearance, but more in actual lifestyle. We're going to try a little bit later on to become like the 1960s. That's all rather fun. And realistically, the only thing we can modify in an evening is our outward appearance. So we'll probably be modifying our dress code and our outward appearance to become like the 1960s. That's just an external match. But if we're going to become like Jesus, we become like Jesus by doing what Jesus did. The news about Jesus spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often, I noticed that word there, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Jesus prayed 
frequently. Do I pray frequently? I'm not sure it's frequently enough. Why don't I pray frequently enough? Because my life is already full of stressful activities. That's perhaps the stupidest <laughs> answer you can ever give to a question, isn't it? My life is full of stress, so I don't have time to pray. What were you hoping prayer would do? Well, reduce the stress. But I don't take time to reduce the stress because I'm stressed. <laughs> you see. And again, that's Brother Paul's point. By the time I say it out loud, I suddenly realize that's ridiculous. I need to change what I'm doing. Jesus was the closest to the Father, uh, closest of all to the Father. I and the Father are one, he said. What a beautiful statement. And given doctrinal concerns, we often take that statement and listen to it and say, yes, but he doesn't mean, well, never mind what he doesn't mean. Let's pause for a moment's reflection amongst those of like-minded spirit and pause to consider what he did mean. I and my Father are one. I don't need to add anything. That's a beautiful statement. Why pray? Your kingdom come, for example. Jesus uh, instructed his disciples, asked, Lord, how shall we pray? And he gave them some suggested ideas. And one of those was, your kingdom come. I hope we believe that. Do we believe that God's kingdom will come? I'm hoping that's a general yes. A little quieter than I hope for, but uh, <laughs> it's still a form of assent, so we'll go with that. Will it come? Yes, we believe it will come. Brothers and sisters, will God's kingdom come if I don't pray for it? Yes. Let me go one step further. Will it come if I pray for it not to come? Yes. So why pray? Why pray for that? That's not a case of articulating my understanding any better. I already know what the understanding is. Your kingdom come. It's a very direct statement. It's not a complex feeling. So why pray? It helps our conviction. That's an excellent answer. We're going to come on to that. I think there's one, uh, I'm, I'm going to come to that just directly, but just before I come to that one, that the days may be shortened. Who said that? Very good. TJ at the back there. It very well may change the speed at which the kingdom comes, that the days may be shortened, as Brother uh, TJ said. There's good scriptural evidence, not only in that promise for something that hasn't yet happened, but for the things that did happen when they were prayed for, that the fervency and the multitude and the magnitude of prayers offered actually affected the speed at which the answer arrived. The more people praying often affected the speed at which God's will played out. And I think that's maybe why one of the reasons it's said in the scriptures no man knows the day or the hour or the year when the Son of Man shall return. And I think one of the reasons no man knows the day is because the day is not fixed. And one of the parameters on which it flexes is how much prayer and how much desire we express and that the Father hears us express. Do you really want Jesus to come? If you do, pray. Pray more frequently for it. Pray harder for it. And it very well, according to the promises of Scripture, may come sooner. That's reasonable. Every time God speaks about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, he tends to use the analogy of harvest time, some harvest of barley or wheat or, or anything. Ask any farmer. Don't look at me. The closest I've got to farming is a roommate growing tomatoes on the windowsill. <laughs> That's about as close as it gets. But that's, that's the limit of my understanding of farming. But even then, I gain enough education from that to think about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. On what day are you going to pick those tomatoes, roommate? Well, what did the roommate reply? When they're ready. When they're red, not green. And so, who are the tomatoes? That's us. Our color dictates the coming of harvest time. So that's a very good reason why to pray. It also changes us. Two people have already commented uh, articulately to that end. It changes us. It increases our desire by making our vision more tangible. The more we picture something, even if it isn't physically in front of us, if there's a picture of it in our mind, then the more we are attached to it. So as you pray for the kingdom, paint pictures of it in your mind. 
Think what certain parts of the earth will look like, physically or geographically or socioeconomically or whatever. Paint those pictures and look at those pictures and describe those pictures in your prayer that you desire because then the picture will uh, make things more tangible to you. Are, any, are there any in the room who have a uh, predilection for chocolate, perhaps? Raise a hand. <laughs> oh, Warwick, your hand was up faster than anyone else's. I'm, I'm very impressed. Do you eat hot uh, oh, I'm always guilty. That's just taken as red. I am. Yes, that's right. Uh, it's, not, it's not a guilty thing. Don't worry. Chocolate is not bad. So, um, <laughs> it's rapidly coming to my own defense. Um, anyone would fancy some chocolate right now? I realize you've just had dinner. Andrew would. Good for Andrew. Okay, so think about how much you might like that chocolate. Now have a look at that for a few seconds. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. There you go. That's and you may notice that your des if you had that desire to start with, that your desire may actually increase. Why is your desire increased? Because there's a visual realization of the desire itself. And that's, if that's true for chocolate, something that's simple and something that's meaningless, then my goodness, how much more true is that going to be for the kingdom of God? Paint a picture. See the details. Describe the details in your prayer. So it changes us. Desiring the kingdom actually makes us more suitable for the kingdom. God is love. And so those who populate his kingdom best are those who love it most. Those who love it most are those who desire it most. And those who desire it most are those who've increased their desire by whatever mechanism. Let me take that picture away, because <laughs> otherwise you'll, <laughs> you'll be thinking, it. They're right, very good, you're welcome. That's how um, we can operate in our prayers to uh, change both ourselves and potentially, can we believe it, even potentially the start time of the kingdom. It is still likely, though ever less probable, that the kingdom will come in 2015, but if not, 2016 is but around the corner and awaits our opportunities. Three words when preparing for the kingdom was on Jesus' mind and he spoke to that, uh, that effect and all of a sudden he spat out three random words right in the middle of his dialogue and he said, remember Lot's wife. What, what was that about? Why remember Lot's wife? We don't even know her name. Remember Lot's wife? Desire. Where is your desire? We are going forwards out of Egypt, so to speak, not backwards. Where is your desire? Your desire is where your vision is. Where was Lot's wife's vision? Pointing forward for a while, and then, well, well, kind of liked what was back there. The Israelites in the wilderness said similar things and perished therein. Remember Lot's wife. Her desire was behind her. Ours needs to be ahead. Lord, Teach us to pray, they said. And so Jesus gave them uh, this prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I've divided, if you are able to discern colors, I've divided uh, that prayer into three separate colors because I think there are three separate sections uh, that are in that prayer, and I think that's as much of the instruction Jesus gave as ever the words were. I think he wants us to learn and use. I don't wish, wish to criticize my friend, but I have a friend who is now of relatively great age, over the age of 80, not a brother, but he prays at mealtime which is good, and he is thankful to God, which is excellent. And at every mealtime, he says these words and no other. And he eats three meals a day, and he's over 80 years of age. And if that's three meals a day, I'm going to get into trouble here, three meals a day at about 300 days per year, that's going to be about 1,000 prayers per year, and he's done this for at least 50 years. He's said this prayer 50,000 times. I'm unable to persuade him to try anything different now. Was that what Jesus wanted from us? To say this prayer 50,000 times. I think it's an excellent prayer. But I think he wants us to learn the principles and the structure as well as the content of the prayer and use it in designing and adapting our own prayers to that end. 
What do you notice about uh, the purple section? What's that prayer about? It's about things about God. We don't need complex language here. What's the green words about? Things about God's will. I like that. I heard that from somewhere. Things about God's plans. And what's the blue part about? It's about us. Things about us. Lord, teach us to pray, said the disciples. Okay, said Jesus, do this. First, pray about God. Mention him. Comment on him. Comment on your relationship with him. Then think about the plans that God has in place. And then think about you. I've known that for a long time. And to this very day, I can still catch myself in prayers, private prayers, that immediately launch into, it's about me, thanks. And I catch myself on that on at least a weekly basis. And yet the Lord has said, this is how to pray, in this order. There's another sequence of things that has this same structure. Do you know what it is? I'm sure you do. The Ten Commandments was nervously whispered over here, but was more, more confidently said over there. I think you're absolutely right. If we look at the Ten Commandments, no other gods before me, love the Lord your God. You shall not bow down to idols. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Those are things about God. Then you have remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Things about God's plans. He had a plan and a structure for the week and for the family. And finally, things about us. In fact, if there are ten commandments on two tablets of stone, and unlike the example given in the background, the Bible is clear that the tablets were written on both sides. Most TV and movie representations miss that. But if there are ten commandments written on both sides, on two tablets... It's perhaps reasonable to suspect that there were five commandments on one tablet and five commandments on the other. Speculation. If so, there was an entire tablet about things about God and an entire tablet, the second tablet, things about us. There's an actual separation there, even physically, I notice, if that speculation is true. So always, God's things, God's, God, God's plans, our needs. So, you shall not murder it's number six. It's the most important offense that can ever be committed against man. And all too often I will see in the online newspapers people talking about murder as the ultimate crime. It is the ultimate crime, but only if there is no God. Once you've thrown the first tablet of stone out the window, then it's the top commandment. And that's what's happened in our world today. But in actual fact, God says, this is number six. But number three might be, don't misuse my name, which people cheerily do multiple times per day. Our prayers need to have the same structure. So if we're going to learn how to pray, I would say that's a one concrete way we can learn how to pray. Analyze your own prayers whilst you're saying them. Am I praying about God before I'm praying about me? If I could add any... Uh, thoughts or learning from personal experience, I would say this would be my second piece of advice. Pray directly. What do I mean by that? I mean, pray for what you want. And you might say, well, that's stupid. I, I do. Do you? Ask yourself, do you actually pray for what you want? Here's my guess at the things that we want. I can't speak for all of you. I have to guess. We want to be happy and fulfilled. We want to save the lives of others, genuinely. We want to be closer to God. We want to have protection for our loved ones. We want to have our minds transformed so that we desire the things of Christ, not the things of the world. We want to feel secure about our future. We want peace of mind. Do we pray for those things? I wonder. Those are the actual goals, but I wonder if... The prayers that I hear, and the prayers often for which I am solicited, please would you help me pray for this, tend to look like this. They're prayers for a home, a spouse, a baptism, a job, children. And I suppose, my guess is, the reason that we pray for these 
is because we believe these will fulfill these. I want to be fulfilled, so I pray for a partner. But what did I do that for? I should pray for fulfillment. I want to be closer to God, so I pray to be involved in a big preaching campaign. I want to feel secure about my future, so I pray that I'll get that job. But I might get that job and not be the slightest bit secure in my future. I might be married and not feel the slightest bit fulfilled. Why didn't I pray for what I actually wanted? And so over the years, I've learned to pray for this column and not for any of the tangibles that I might trick my mind into thinking what will actually come in this uh, column. And there's another advantage to praying directly. You're able to catch yourself out when you cheat. Do not be... uh, Do not be surprised that the human mind is deceitful above all things. You might pray that this preaching campaign be tremendously successful and we have at least five, maybe ten baptisms as a a result of three months' work, for example. That's a beautiful thing to pray for, isn't it? But what if I'm praying actually to be proved right? I designed this preaching campaign and I said do it like this, And the other guy had tried to do it like that for six months and nothing happened. So if we do it like this, like I said, and we get a lot of baptisms, that's why I'm praying for the baptisms. And I can catch myself in things like that. Sometimes what I'm really praying for is to be proved right, or to indulge myself, or to look superior. And that can happen when we pray for these indirect tangibles. Because in the indirect tangible, you can hide a lot of things that you're little undermined will sneak in under the tangible. But when you pray directly for fulfillment or protection for loved ones without any of the tangible coverings, you will discover if any of these rather less uh, worthy things have crept in with your thinking because you'll be analyzing your desires absolutely directly. So that's my second piece of advice. Pray directly. God will choose whatever tangibles to supply in order to to fulfill the direct goal for which you're praying. So at this point, we come to a rather unusual uh, section. I'm going to show you uh, literal testimonies of real people, neither of whom you know, um, who have uh, commented and agreed to comment publicly on their prayer life. Now, at some point, particularly in the second case, it's very personal. I've cut out the bits that are sort of a little bit too gruesome. But uh, I think it's useful uh, to see real people in action in their prayer lives who are happy to comment upon them. And one of them is a very happy story. That will be the second one. Uh, Therefore, a first will address uh, this one. The, The name is a pseudonym, not her real name. And she comments in this way. If you had asked me as a young Christian whether I believed in prayer, I would have quickly said yes. I would have told you about the time I spun out in the snow and didn't get hurt, or the time I dropped a house key somewhere in my 74 Dodge Dart and couldn't find it for hours until I prayed. Maybe God takes care of neophyte believers, I don't know. He doesn't seem to take care of old timers, though. I could list probably a hundred prayers that haven't been answered. I'm not speaking of selfish prayers, but important prayers. God, keep my kids safe. Keep them away from the wrong crowd. All three ended up in trouble with the law, abusing drugs and alcohol. I've got to say, Jesus' story of the persistent widow sours. Thousands of people pray for a Christian leader who has cancer, and he dies. What did Jesus mean by the parable? That we keep beating our heads against a wall? I'd guess maybe 20% of my prayers get anything like the answer I want. Over the time, I give up. I pray for those things I believe will happen, or I just don't pray. I review my journal and see God doing less and less. I get mad. Like a child, I stop talking. I'm passive-aggressive with God. I put him off. Maybe later. I went to a mentor and poured out my soul describing in detail all I've been through in the past few years with my health and especially with my kids. 
What do I do? I asked. He sat there for the longest time and said, I don't know, Joanne. He sighed. I waited for words of wisdom. None came. That's how it is with prayer, too. So, one thing we can conclude, the prayer life was a bad experience. What had gone wrong? Challenge yourself. That woman has come to you earlier on this afternoon, sat down next to you on the bench, and said precisely that. What's your response? If we're disciples of Christ, we should be ready for moments such as these. We'll think about that in just a minute, but before we do, let's introduce our uh, second uh, testimony. Hilda. My family in Costa Rica had no money, and so when I was four years old, my mother sold me into sexual slavery. Men pay a lot of money to have their way with children. So while other kids my age went to school, I worked in a brothel, turning over all my earnings to my mother. All my life I felt ugly and dirty, ashamed. I learned to drink alcohol and use cocaine very early as a way to dull the pain. When I was a teenager, I had two children of my own. From then on, I worked harder to earn money to support my children. It was the only way I could show my love for them. One day, a customer got furious when I wouldn't do what he asked. He pulled a knife on me, then hit me with a baseball bat, splitting my head open. <clears throat> they took me to the hospital, and I lay in that bed, plotting to kill myself. Finally, I got down on my knees beside the bed and pled with God. I wanted somehow to escape prostitution, to become a real mother to my children. And God answered that prayer with a miracle. He gave me a vision. I actually saw the words, look for Rahab Foundation. I was barely literate and didn't know the word Rahab. It's not a Spanish word. One of the nurses helped me find their number, though, and I called. The phone rang and rang, and I prayed, Lord, if you really exist, make somebody answer that phone. At last, a woman named Mariliana answered. Turns out she was the director of Rahab, which was closed for the day, but she had stopped by to pick up some papers. I need help, I told Mariliana. I'm dying. I can't take it anymore. She told me that God loved me and would not leave me alone. She would help me get away from prostitution and start a new life. A few days later, she brought me to her home, bruised and bandaged, fresh from the hospital. She welcomed me with a huge hug and said, You're safe here, Hilda. She told me Rahab was named for a prostitute in the Bible, one who became a heroine. I couldn't believe the hope on Mariliana's face. It felt like a dream. She gave me a clean bed, flowers in the room, and a promise that no men would harass me. She introduced me to other women who had left prostitution. She taught me how to be a real mother, and now I am studying a trade to live for the glory of God. Now, some fairly stark details in there, and I apologize uh, for any shock they cause, but I think it's valuable to consider this testimony because one thing we can conclude, in opposite to the first testimony, the prayer life had been a very beneficial experience. What had gone right? Why has God chosen one and ignored the other, or so it seems? Where shall we find an answer? We will find an answer where we always find an answer. It's the word of God that will give us the answer. Luke chapter 15. And we'll find that here lies a very good key to the answer. And that's why, uh, thank you, Brother John, he read that uh, passage for us. Luke chapter 15 begins this way. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said, Father, give me my share of the estate. We're going to focus just on that younger son uh, for the purpose of this evening, and we're going to focus on two prayers. This is his prayer in a before state, and the other prayer we're going to look, after, look out for is the same man, even though it's a hypothetical character, uh, after his transformation. When he came to his senses, he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. And we know the education we're going to get from these words is excellent because they were never spoken by a fallible human mind. Rather, Jesus crafted them himself in a parable for us. Do you see the difference between those two prayers? Look again. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said, Father... Give me, let's just stop there. That's really all we need. We just need those three words. 
Father, give me. That's an excellent summary of that prayer. What he was asking to be given doesn't really matter. We can take the quote away. That was the nature of the prayer. And the second prayer, when he came to his senses, he said, Father, make me. Those three words. Sufficient, I think, therefore we can just drop uh, that quote away too. Those, that's the essence of the two different prayers. Jesus is always teaching us everything he says, everything he does. And he's saying, there's a man who grew up, and whilst he was still immature and spiritually young, he prayed, Father, give me. But after he had matured, he prayed, Father, make me. And you'll notice the difference about give me and make me. Give me, I don't have to do anything. I just sit here and people give me things. That's actually true in the dining hall. I'm slow to get up and people bring me things. It's wonderful. <laughs> Father, give me. But in the second case, Father, make me, there has to be giving from both sides because the person who is about to be made has to give effort or give up control in order to be changed. So let's look at those two prayers again and realize this may have been the reason of the difference between them. You put up the same words. This time I'm just going to read the ones that I've highlighted in the yellow typeface. I could list probably a hundred prayers that haven't been answered. How do you know they haven't been answered? Because it wasn't the answer that I wanted. God, keep my kids safe. Keep them away from the wrong pr crowd. I'd guess maybe 20% of my prayers get anything like the answer I want. So God was never really given a choice. God was given a set of instructions to fulfill, a Santa Claus list. Father, give me is the underlying spirit of this prayer. And perhaps why it was indulged early on, when she was still young, but as she grew older, her prayer life never actually matured, and she just became angry that things didn't happen. We pray to God sometimes, but sometimes insist on retaining control of what the outcome must look like. We don't pray in intangibles that allow God to work. We just say, God, you need to do, God, give me, let me get that job. Let me get that job, God. And you don't get it. Did he really deny your prayer? Or was the prayer not well sculpted? Father, I'm feeling very insecure about my financial future. Please, solve my insecurity. I might get a job that gives more money, or the insecurity may be taken away some other means. All prayers in this sense become orders issued to God for him to perform. Father, give me this specific thing. The consequence is God is reduced to a cosmic slave. He just gets to fulfill the orders that we send heavenwards. And any contradiction of our predetermined outcome can induce a faith crash. Any horrific disaster we may observe in our personal or broader social life may suddenly say, how can there be a God when this happens? And in a way, that claim is true. That God is indeed dead. That God must fail. That God doesn't exist. God is not a cosmic slave available to our direction. If we are giving the instructions of how God must operate, who really is God to us? It's us. Rather, Hilda's prayer. I got down on my knees beside the bed and pled with God. I wanted to become a real mother to my children. How? By being given what? She doesn't specify. She specifies a godly goal and says, God, you will know the path to get there, and I am open to your manipulation and control to arrive at that end. Mariliana taught me how to be a real mother, and now I am studying a trade to live for the glory of God, Father, make me, is clearly the basis of this young lady's prayer. And so we've seen the tangible results that happen from a lifetime of Father, give me prayers and a lifetime of Father, make me prayers. And I suppose the obvious question that needs to be asked while we sit here in potential judgment of the lives of others, 
Which one is my most common prayer? Think about the last 12 prayers you gave. If your memory's not so good, think about the last three. Which would be the best summary of those three prayers? Could you say it was this one? Or would you say, well, it was probably that one? Father, give me prayers are not wicked or wrong, but they are the neophyte level. They are the beginner's level of prayer. And perhaps they still have some place in later life. But we need to make sure that our prayer life is maturing from Father, give me, generically into Father, make me. It can apply even at that most intimate of times that we share together as a community as we pass bread and wine behind. And sometimes we use that time, we don't have to, to think about the forgiveness that that salves us and joins us in closer union with our Master. Father, give me this bread. Father, give me this wine. Father, give me forgiveness. Why not? All three are freely given. Or how about, Father, with this bread and with this wine, make me that better disciple I desire to be and yet cannot be alone. I think the the difference between the the dramatic endings of the Father give me prayer and the Father make me prayer come from their uh, essential basis, that one is based in entitlement and one is based in hope. Look again at the words that were in the testimony. I've got to say, Jesus' story of the persistent widow sours. Thousands of people pray for a Christian leader who has cancer and he dies. Why does that make you annoyed? Because I had a right to see him healed. Didn't I just pray for it? Does God not hear English? Is he deaf? I had a right. I was entitled to what I prayed for. And if if you're entitled to what you pray for, that's a bad start. But entitlement and hope are relatively similar things. They're they're massively different in end result, but they can look similar to start with. That's why the confusion can come. He gave me a vision, says Hilda. I couldn't believe the hope on Mariliana's face. Better then that our prayers are grounded in hope. We know our Father is a loving Father. And whatever happens will work out for the best loving care of all concerned. Entitlements lead to demands. We have a right to see this man healed. But hope leads to pleas. Finally, I got down on my knees beside the bed and pleaded with God. I desperately desire to change. I acknowledge my inability to make it happen myself. And finally, therefore, demands when not met, or if not met, will necessarily lead to bitterness and anger. I review my prayer journal and see God doing less and less. I get angry. Because why are you angry? My demand wasn't met. Why did you have the right to make a demand? Because I was entitled to see my prayer answered. And this is the pathway to a very unhappy prayer life. Better still, the hope that leads to the plea that can lead to joy and praise and motivation. It felt like a dream, she says. I am studying a trade to live for the glory of God, praise of God, motivation with the trade, joy in the dream. These are the natural emotional byproducts of going down a prayer life founded this way. The Father make me prayer. So we can see these words of Scripture. The Bible isn't some dead old book speaking from thousands of years ago in esoteric terms. It affects real people's real lives, whether they see it or whether they don't. We could be either one of these people. Do we invite God to be present in our lives. This is a a matter very much centered in the United States where I live, where it is mandatory now that God is removed, even by reference, uh, from educational and other state and federally run establishments. For years, we've been telling God to get out of our schools, to get out of our government, and to get out of our lives. Being the gentleman that he is, I believe that he has calmly backed out. How can we expect God to give us his blessing and his protection if we demand that he leave us alone? Whilst that's a good comment, it's an excellently insightful comment on a national and social scale, I wonder 
So what level is that? Could that also be true in your life and my life personally? Have we invited God to be present? Do we need to invite God to be present? Isn't he with us anyway? Ah, you mean, do we have a right to having God with us? There's some very interesting passages in the scripture that show that God actually looks for his disciples to invite him to be present. You may not have noticed this, because I, I certainly didn't notice this, but when Israel went out into the wilderness under Moses, God had initially said, I'm not coming with you. Do you remember that? I, did, I missed that. <laughs> I managed to read so fast, I just skipped right over the top of it. God said, I'll paraphrase, you guys are really annoying and you tick me off every five minutes. I'll tell you what, if I come with you, I'll probably wipe you out at some point. I will meet you at the promised land, off you go. Clearly that's a bit of a paraphrase. You are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you even for a moment, I might destroy you. It's actually pretty accurate to what was said. To which Moses replied, Lord, if your presence does not go with us, don't even send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you. That's why God was with the children of Israel in the wilderness. It actually was the basis of an invitation from Moses. Without it, God wasn't going to go with them. He was going to meet them at the promised land. God accompanies only when invited to do so. God will do as he will. I'm not trying to say God is somehow constrained by our thoughts. If he decides he will bust into someone's life in any such way, he certainly will. Take Pharaoh, for example. But this is a text that at least says God is looking for us to invite him along if we want him to be present and active in our lives. Guess what? Jesus always does the same thing. Jesus is the mirror image of his Father, the perfect image and the perfect representation of the Father. As they approached the village where they were going along the road to Emmaus, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. They invited him, and he went in. You'll find the same thing in John chapter 6 on the sea. That time that Jesus was walking on the water, don't be misled into thinking he was walking towards them to come into the boat. He was walking, towards, he was walking and he came into their sight and was going to go past them. And they called to him, and it's their call that made him come to them. I believe Jesus operates that way in your life and in mine. I believe he makes himself clearly visible on the horizon and says, hello, I'm walking by. And then it's up to us to say, wait, no, don't walk by. Please come in, reside with me. And Jesus accepts invitations to come and reside. Have I invited Jesus to reside with me? Have you? Has it been a prayer of yours? Is it a constant prayer of yours? Is it a rare prayer of yours? Has it ever been a prayer of ours? And that, I think, is the education we gain from how to pray from the Lord Jesus Christ. And that wraps up, then, our various series on growing closer to God. And I thank you very much for your attention. In summary, then, what did we see? Ruth gave us this advice, spread your wings, meaning provide mercy. If you spread your wings, you'll learn to fly closer to heaven. Jacob said, no wrestling. The end never justifies the means. Wait upon the Lord. It took him a whole life to learn that. John the Baptist told us, you want to grow closer to God? Take care of the poor. And Jesus says, pray more. Invite me to be part of your journey and part of your discipleship. This is what we've learned from these fascinating scriptural characters on the topic, Growing Closer to God.